All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry for the late start, but let's go ahead uh, and begin our Facilities and Finance Committee meeting. Present, we have uh, Paul Stark King, we have LT Taylor, um, oh my gosh, Tracy. Tracy. Tracy, Mark, yeah. Jeff, Dan, Randy Alexander, Dr. Henderson, I said Jeff, and? Terry Evans. Terry Evans, thank yeah. you. And then joining us remotely, um, we have, oh gosh, a whole bunch of people. Participants? It looks like. Yeah. Um, we have Joe Slattery, we have Jessica Wagner, uh, Mary O'Rourke is, oh, she's not down here? She's yes, she's not. Okay, Al McDonald, Carl Giamatti, Michael Dolter, yeah. Angelo Cagno, Dr. Yeah. Tarballis are all remote, it looks like. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Mm -hmm. Paul, you want to kick us off? Uh, sure. Um, citizens' comments, we had one. Well, hello. We've been joined by uh, Teresa Kelly and Stella Patterson. Good evening, board members of District 209. My name is Jeremy Horn, resident of the Village of Forest Park and Proviso East High School graduate alum, class of 2003. The comment that I want to address is that I am so impressed with the renovation of my beloved high school alma mater. I drove past my alma mater and the visitor's parking lot looks 10 times better than the old visitor's parking lot. It is getting major positive responses from community members and graduate slash alumni. I am so looking forward to when the phase one of the renovation um, is completed. I, along with other graduates and alumni, never thought that I would uh, witness the moment of the renovation of Proviso East. I am definitely looking forward to phase two of the communication of the continuation of the renovation of the hundred plus year old high school campus. This is my first time commenting on the Finance and Facilities Committee meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horn. And that's all public comment. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at the minutes from July 27. If there are no questions, then let's go ahead and just approve those. No. All right, then let's get to the good stuff, the facility master plan updates. Um, so uh, we, reading the minutes from a minute ago, we've come a, a long way in a month. Um, things are, are uh, back on track, I think, relative to the PMSA parking lot. Um, East is 
He had a lot of uh, beautiful work done. Uh, West's uh, parking lot was shown off at the back of the school bash of um, a week or more ago. And um, so um, Mark Gallagher from Perkins and Will is here. Good afternoon. And I have my team online. They will be a part of the presentation. Good afternoon again. So a couple of things we'll go through is our update on projects. Uh, we're going to take you through uh, or, or remind us all on uh, how we set up the project in terms of the overall package, including contingencies, allowances, etc. And then we're going to have an update on the construction itself, where we are. So with that, Proviso League Stadium. Uh, some items that we have asked for feedback from the district. Uh, Roof option, south entry option, this is location. Uh, we'll give you an update on the locker room uh, for the uh, out building and the specifications on the timing system. So, the roof configuration itself for the concession locker building, we have three options options one, two, and three. Uh, option one, which has a uh, simple gable roof which you'll see on, your, on the left, is what we see is definitely uh, most, it should be definitely, we anticipate being within the budget, and this is something that Gilbane is currently reviewing right now. Um, option two provides a clear story, so you'll see in the upper left, a clear story, it'll get more natural daylight into the building, it also gives more presence to the building, that's one of the things that we want to do provides a lead as well as building the presence. And option three is a, is a bit of a hybrid of option two, where it just continues on the, uh, the clear story to make it larger, a little more dramatic, if you will. However, I think the general thought from the design team and from our input from the administrative team we've been working with is generally leaning towards option two, uh, but that's obviously up to the Board of Education to decide. So that uh, is where we are with the, yes? I have a question. Um, those are, you would say, flat roofs? These are not flat roofs. They're not, they are, they are elevated or tilted? These are all sloped roofs. That's they correct. are. Yes. So okay, because here they look flat. It's, it's the angle. I, I, I see what you're, uh, you're getting at. Mm -hmm. Come around. Yeah, they look flat. The front part is sloping this way, and this part is sloping this way. Okay. So it has more to do with the angle that we're showing you the image. Okay. But it's, think of it as, as more like just this type of a shape. So it's all going straight up to the center. And it will slope off. It'll slope off, yeah. Really gutter. Okay, great. If I go with those flat roofs, they'll do. Good Mark, question, no flat roofs. Mark, in option three, isn't that uh, the area over the entrance, the east letters there? Is, is that part flat or is that part sloped? Team, help me on that one. That's a, that is a flat roof uh, yeah. canopy that goes across there. Uh, we would add some positive slope to that roof to allow for draining to, to one edge of that. Good question. Paul. How long is this pitch? Oh, very mm -hmm. good, very good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and as, as Michael is saying, I mean, just so you all know, there's no actual flat roof, even what's considered a Visual flat roof generally has at least a one uh, one quarter inch to a foot slope to it. Well, all the flat roofs that I've seen have been I, flat, and they and, and they uh, and they leave. no so point and, well made, and that is not the intention, and is is corrected here. I mean, okay. in, in my mind's eye, there's no reason why option three cannot have a positive, a more positive slope like option two. Okay. I think that's what it wants to be. Thank you. We're going to shift gears now at Proviso East to the uh, to the entry off of Madison Street. Hey, 
Um, Mark, um, we did not have at the time of putting these slides together the incremental cost estimates. Uh, Joe is texting me that he does have those if we want to talk to, about them right now while these slides are up. Yeah. Very good. Uh, go ahead, Joe. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Perfect. So as, as uh, Mark was saying, the option number one is within the budget. Option number two is about a $100,000 upcharge. And option three is about a $110,000 upcharge. So it's, they're, they're rather incremental, but just so you have a, a kind of scale, option two is 100, and option three is 110. Thousand up charge from our base bid, our base estimate. I'm sorry. I have a question about option three when it says it has a shed, so that means there's storage space with that one. Uh, the um, what the descriptor has to do with um, architectural terminology of shed roof with a clear story. Okay. It is not expanding the size of the building. Okay, so none of the options with the taller um, heights would give us any more storage area? No or? more usable space. Okay. What it does is provide more presence to the building and provide more internal light to the building. So the area in option two, it allows direct light in and coming down into the central zone of the building that it wouldn't otherwise have. Which would be locker rooms. And yeah, but there still is area. clear story at the front of the building. Was just cosmetics, purely cosmetics. Aesthetic. Um, mm -hmm. Shy away from the word cosmetic. <laughs> I think there's there's actually a value though to the natural light being brought to the interior the, yeah. of the building. Okay. But to your point, mm -hmm. Alexander, it is it, there's no functional change between the three the three mm -hmm. options. I guess it's a clearer question would be a hundred thousand or hundred ten thousand dollars just for a better look. Does that sunlight, to your point, provide any type of value? It provides value in that it makes for the spaces that are inside to be uh, less generally dim. You have the just the feeling of natural light coming in. Uh, that you could have be in the space even with the lights on and again not be literally in the dark except for in the evening. Uh, it, it's, it's a preference. It, it, it's a fine thing to have and, and I'm being careful here not to sway the, the decision. It is uh, from given the upgrades that provides the east, the idea of the presence of the building is something that <coughs> material of the conversation, right? Meaning, it's not just like the simplest box it can possibly be. It wants to be something that is fitting, you feel proud of, you feel good looking back on the decision 10 years from now. Uh, we believe you'll feel good about each of these. There's no wrong decision. Uh, we're, we are recognizing that with option two and three, with incremental benefit of some more natural daylight. We want to make it clear that there's a cost associated with that. Um, lifespan? Lifespan. Um, I'm going to call in from the team. I, I don't see a functional lifespan difference. Uh, my, the, the roofing itself <laughs> material would not would not change. The clear story, and the clear story that we refer to is the glass. Right. That Functionally, um, we'll be there 35 years from now, plus, like any older building. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if there's any material uh, lifespan change on that. So it is our intention, Perkins and Will has put together a um, survey, I guess a survey video with links that the superintendent's office is going to be sending out. Now that we have these numbers, we can add it to the um, to the video and give you the information relative to cost. And uh, then the intention is that you would, you know, respond with your preference um, so that we can give some guidance to Perkins and Will on what design to focus on. Um, so. That look, I think you can look for that probably in the next couple days, um, for sure. 
Very good. So shifting gears at this time to the, uh, the south entry. This is going off to Madison. The Memorial Arch, to give you context, you have Memorial Hall, or come around. Memorial Hall, on the left side, you have Madison Memorial Arch, the new concession building. So that's a true on each of these four options. So in brief, the first option is for the idea of relocating yes. Memorial Arch. And uh, needless to say, that is, is something that, you know, you deconstruct it and reconstruct it. Second option is to uh, maintain Memorial Arch where it's at and <coughs> it provides additional parking but it would just be a dead end. The first option, by the way, provides a new access way from Madison with additional parking and a throat into the auto shop, and extending up. So option two then maintains Memorial Arch, no access out to Madison. Option three maintains the Memorial Arch, however, it has two access ways, one to the right and one to the left. One way in and a one way out. This comes with additional cost to the project budget. It would be an increase. That is something that Joe Slattery would speak to. To what degree it increases, he will speak to that. And option four is um, a bit of a hybrid, meaning it, it maintains Memorial Arch in its current location. It provides additional parking, and it still provides the ability for access to Madison. It does that. Uh, and maintains the, the budget as it's currently laid out. Uh, Mark, this is Michael. For uh, If I could make a clarification on option number one, uh, the relocation of the arch is the actual stone arch itself. The um, the intent would not be to rebuild the brick piers in the, as it is in the current, uh, the current budget profile that we have right now, um, would be fine to find some way to reuse the arch itself in, in place. Thank you. Is that clear? That, that clarification Michael provided? It would not be the entire arch that would be rebuilt, or not the entire um, masonry structure. It would be the limestone arch. I think it says class of 1922 on it or something. Yeah. And this is Ned. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Yeah. So, one of the challenges of attending football games at East is there's the parking that's on the south side of Madison, and then people are just trying to cross the street, and there's no. Is will this be able to address that problem? Um, no, this is Mike Goldberg again for Pins and Will. The uh, the plan. Uh, uh, one of the benefits of shifting the entire stadium over to. Uh, the east is we're able to provide some parking to the west of the stadium there um, that, that will uh, help with faculty staff students and event parking um, the decision can be made uh, at a later date on whether or not we you know, truncate off that area for parking or or open it up to spectator parking depending on how well that's used a majority of, of spectator parking will be to the north in that new lot um, which and that can provide access to the stadium fairly easily as well. Um, so, so the intent is that we do have some parking that's that's immediately adjacent to the stadium. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I wasn't thinking about that. Yeah. The, the the new north lot will be a lot safer. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. LT has some um, input from the building relative to, I think, option three and option four and what might happen during an event in the stadium. So um, Dr. Hardy and the team at Proviso East, we met uh, last Thursday or last Wednesday, I believe. Option number four, I'm sorry, option number three is the most sought after option. He would like an in and an out. We do believe the most economical is option four. But if you look to the right, when you are you pulling in right there in, in option number three, you notice that the curb line is really close to the building. We're trying to shy away from that because you do have to plow in that area in the wintertime. 
and it's really close to that close to that building and also when people are pulling in there you know it's really close so we're trying to shy away from option number three but obviously we're open to any decision that the school board and the superintendent's office makes and i think you had mentioned that um some of the building folks said if we did option three they would look to block those off during events um so you know the band can stage their buses um, from opposing teams can can stage there um, it would relieve some of the pressure of the narrow uh, walkway there for the concession stand mm -hmm. uh, and things like that so that was one of the thoughts and then as the events of letting out then you can open it up as a relief for for parking um, and i think that would apply to three or four is that right. correct okay. yeah. And Paul, to, to build on that, uh, the, the one the one challenge here is that the uh, the image isn't expanded all the way to the east side of that new concessions building. Um, in option number three, uh, because of the lack of space that we have, it's pushed pretty tight to the to the uh, uh, track as well. So option uh, two two and four uh, can allow us to move that concession building a little further away from the track, also to provide some uh, uh, some gap and some the space between the, the building and the track as well. Uh, Joe, do you have those uh, numbers yet for the various cost differentials? I do, I do. Um, so, Gilbane has been carrying a budget uh, associated with option number one. Since it was in development, we just had a line item there of $50,000. So that's the base cost that allows the designers to come up with a some remedy to relocating the arch. So looking at that and saying, okay, we have a $50,000 bucket, every other option is a credit. It's cheaper to do option two and option four than it is to uh, demolish and relocate the archway. So two and four are credits in the neighborhood of 30,000 and 40,000 respectfully. Option three is a little bit of an add. Let me go back and check it. So I'm not going up. 20, 21,140 dollars. So we're not talking a lot of dollars in either scenario. We are talking credits off of the current estimate for everything except option one, which is what's in the estimate, and option three, which would be a little bit more uh, work, asphalt, concrete, uh, but no, we're not doing anything to the archway, we're not doing anything to the, the, uh, the existing masonry piers or the gate that's in between. Everything stays as it is today. The only thing that will change are the, the area around it. Uh, that box that's shown in uh, option three, around the gateway that's going to be all concrete in that area. Uh, other than that, like I said, we're not touching the archway or the masonry in any of options two, three, or four. Okay, so if I may, so if, um, given what, what uh, LT shared, if the, um, Dr. Hardy and his group are leaning towards option three from, let's say, from the school's point of view, the, the upside on the cost, you're saying, Joe, is about, about $22,000, did you say? For option three, yes. Okay. Um, and then the other incremental amount might be if you want it to be a bona fide gate versus a, just putting cones down on game days. Uh, you, you may very well want to be gating this so that you have a very clean way to deal with this similar to the gates that can put on along uh, First Avenue. Okay, so uh, we will add the amounts to each of these options and uh, include it in the survey to, to the board that will be coming out of the superintendent's office in the next day or two. I'm, I'm wondering too, so we have in the favorite from Dr. Hardy and staff and all the functional ways that number three would be good, but then LT is pointing out, you know, in the winter when you're plowing, that's a really tight corner. Well, where's all that snow going to go? Mm -hmm. um, it just makes me think overall, I, I wonder what's, what's the safest option? What's the most functional and the safest option mm -hmm. for students and visitors who are going to be 
you know, or whoever's going to be going in and out. Because number three for flow of traffic looks good to me, you know, but maybe number two where we're blocking it off entirely and just leaving it as kind of a, a space. So would be safer. The, I don't know. the reason why we wanted to provide some type of access to Madison Street, mm -hmm. because right now the to the east behind the football stadium, mm -hmm. there's a main throat there that comes around by the boiler room and you can pull in that by the uh, football stadium on the north end. That is going to terminate when this project is shifted over. There will be access for an emergency vehicle to pull behind the stands and turn around and go back out that way, mm -hmm. but no full access from the main building back through all the way back to Madison Street. And considering we're going to have a lot of visitors uh, doing football games and track meets, we wanted to provide two ways in and two ways out. So that's either option three or four um, provides the best value getting people in and out of the campus. Okay. Not weighing in on your decision making. Uh, what Michael had, oh yes, Ms. Stone. Is it possible that you could get us um, a copy of the sketches of the roof along with the prices and a copy of the sketch of these sketches along with the prices that you just, uh, you know, told us about? So those are, are going to be a part of the survey that's being sent out. Okay, but is, is for the office, did you say? We can come and look at it? I want to know, is there something that I can have in my hand? It's going to be, uh, not, yes, it's going to be sent to you electronically. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You. I appreciate the, the clarification. Mm -hmm. um, lost my train of thought. Oh, what Michael had mentioned, the, the one a benefit to option four is it allows the concession building to slide further to the west providing more distance or buffer between the building and the track itself. That would be, let's say, the upside of option number four, as well as the access. Uh, having said that, we recognize the benefit functionally of the one, the, the access in and the access out. And so we're not, like I said, we're not looking to sway you on that. It's a, it's a tough, tough decision, but it's a no-lose choice. Mark, which option optimizes the space, though? The function of it is going to be primarily for parking. So which of these options is giving us the most parking? The, the delta is pretty much the same uh, for, each, for any one of these options when it comes to the number of spaces. For actual parking? Yeah. Yeah. The, the dis primary distinction with three is that Provide, it has to do with the functionality of being able to come in off of Madison is there one way and to exit out. So it's, it's that, that movement. Uh, you will not be able to have buses come in here and move them around. You try that, that, that very will not work. So it's specifically going to be utilized just for student parking or staff. LT, when you guys talked about it, did you, did you guys discuss it? the function of that for like day-to-day -day operations other than just games, like maybe with an option three or it, will we be using that for student entrance? Will we be using that for staff parking? What would that lot be used for other than the game days? So the auto shop is going into Memorial Hall Gymnasium as we speak and uh, that indentation on the top is a garage door. Right. So a lot of the vehicles, the district owned vehicles get repaired by the auto shop high level students and those vehicles can park in that area during the day and they would be parked out of that space um, during the evening. So that will provide some additional parking for the auto shop uh, if vehicles need to be repaired. Even sometimes the staff bring their cars and get their oil changed, things like that, to give the kids some experience. From our experience, and it's an operational choice on your part, strictly. From our experience, we would not advise look at students generally accessing it here. Right. You have them coming in off the first, keep them there. Operationally, how the, the school wants to function with whether others, you know, faculty, et cetera, come in in the morning, that's a choice to be made. Hey, hey, Joe, uh, one thing about that arch, I, I believe you mentioned that there would be no restoration work done to that arch. The hope was to at least have that limestone power washed and resealed 
And the same thing with that brick on the lower level, to have it grinded and pointed, so that it gives that new look to the entire stadium. And we can look at that, LT. We just haven't really assessed the condition of the existing uh, masonry. Uh, I haven't looked at it, so I don't know if they need any tuck pointing. It, it could just snowball, uh, but it's absolutely something we will look into. I'm, I'm just was stating that the dollars that I was portraying assumed nothing, though you know, power washing. Uh, ceiling of limestone is nothing as cheap, um, but the masonry is the thing that scares me more than anything because I don't know what I'm getting into without really assessing it. Okay. Okay, moving us along. Uh, this comes really it comes back to the, the Kelly, the uh, question that Ms. Kelly asked, and that is this will be sent out electronically. Uh, there is a video being provided. Michael does a voiceover, so he walks you through it. Uh, it's quite effective, and there's a um, uh, with a scanning code, you can actually scan in from your phone uh, a simple way to vote your preferences. Shifting gears now, uh, we're still at East, however. Uh, this has to do with the disc, disc location. We've been looking at a number of different locations. This is something we're working with LT and the athletic director on. Dr. Brown and, and, and Hardy. Dr. Hardy, yes. Mm -hmm. A number of different options have been considered, uh, as shown. Uh, this has to do with what's the, the most optimum location, as well as the conversation about the, the shot put, recognizing that it's possible to have association between the two. So what we, uh, after looking at these different options, uh, option two up here, is looked at more vigorously, and the intent then would be, if it's option two, this is going towards the west, then have the shot put going towards the east. And this allows those same athletes, which more often than not are participating in both of them, to be adjacent to one another. Mm -hmm. I, that is an update, and as well as if there's any questions that you have. I think we'll probably spend a little more time in the building to determine which of these would be, you know, functionally, functionally best. Next item is an update. You've seen the concession building interior a number of times. Uh, we've shared with you previously, I want to uh, give you the latest and greatest that with Dr. Bruder, the, uh, the new athletic director, the request to have an increase in showers. Uh, we've made that accommodation. It, it all really fundamentally did is just change the quantity of, of lockers. I mean, it's what, what can fit in the real estate. And the, the bottom line is we have uh, the 31 full height, 24 inch wide lockers. And it gives us then 44 double height, two tier lockers that are 18 inches wide. And that again is something we're working with the building team on Dr. Bruder, LP, Dr. Hardy, etc. So moving on. You up. said an increase in showers. Pardon me? Did you say an increase in showers? Yes. How many? What from uh, yeah, one to six? Was that six? Yeah, one to six. Yeah, one to six. To six. Yeah. Double the six, too, I see. Did they do that? Wow. Once we expanded the plumbing wall, it allowed that to, to take a sort of a natural progression. Once that real estate went into place, uh, it allowed us to do that for the water closets. Now this is the team at East that are making these recommendations? That's correct. Do we need a price attached to those though, don't we? When you present, we need this to is know some how much. Or do they know or have that has that been discussed yet? Joe uh, Slattery has been looking after that and uh, currently looking at the, the associated costs on that. Joe, is there any comment you have? Uh, at this time, we don't have this pricing. Mike, uh, just getting the final uh, estimate for my my team. Uh, I'll be in a better position to talk about that tomorrow, unfortunately, not today. Perhaps, Mark, and LT, tell me if I'm wrong. When you guys are doing these things, I, I'm, I'm seeing a dream list and a wish list, but I mean, I want it to be realistic and, and within the budget. So, 
maybe if you guys curtail your conversations to what is feasible budget-wise and have that involved in there because I mean these seem like really great ideas but right now we're just we don't know what you know how much this is above or below cost and if you're gonna have those types of conversations I would imagine if I'm shopping for anything I'm looking at the price and whether or not I can afford it so I'm thinking it's a fair point yeah. similar to what we have just shown you on the parking and on the roof mm -hmm. in this case a observation for today we had three water closets toilets previously right. we had the plumbing for the sinks etc the incremental amount and Joe this is where you have to keep me out of trouble the incremental amount for some additional exterior building showers right. and a couple of, of hand sinks is um, the project experience is not a major dollar value is that a correct statement Joe that is correct. You sure, Joe? <laughs> you you estimated. You're, on this, you're behind this camera, man. He's out here by himself. <laughs> I don't even doubt that. I mean, obviously, if anybody who's remodeled the bathroom at home knows they're expensive. But in new construction, throwing in a couple of additional uh, items like that, we're talking, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars. So it's, it's incrementally on uh, uh, the grand scheme of things that we're talking small money. I think uh, design-wise, as we um, progressed, we kind of looped back to a conversation of a few months ago, where the uh, team, uh, the building level team, East team, made the point that they'd like the same functionality as the existing lockers had. Mm -hmm. And the existing lockers had six showers. So that's that's why that direction was given. Um, but we'll, we'll look at it if we need to get some cost savings in here, we'll, we'll look at it. Moving on to summer uh, 2021 projects, uh, Commonwealth ComEd update team. Yeah, hi, this is Carl Perkinson Wooler here. I can jump in and take a couple of these uh, items. Um, so we just wanted to keep the uh, team abreast of some of the uh, design uh, issues and some of the discussion that uh, is taking place as we move towards uh, uh, the, the upcoming summer work. Uh, so the first one is related to the new electrical service at East. Um, obviously, we are working with ComEd for the new electrical services that are going to serve that building there. And uh, you know, we are uh, trying to follow up with them at, 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 uh, on a weekly basis. And uh, you know, at this point, uh, because of the complications with COVID, they're uh, a bit slower than usual in, in getting their design at this point. We're still confident that we'll have all the information we need from ComEd uh, for drawing issuance in early October. Um, but we are you know, having continual conversations with the uh, building management team, LT, Angelo, Paul, um, to keep them updated as we receive information from ComEd. So hey, at Carl. this point, yes. Um, just to, just as, a, as a background information on, on what we're talking about here, the, uh, the intent with the East renovations is also to provide new transformers. We're, we're pulling the transformers out of the subterranean uh, vault that they're in right now, which is prone to flooding, and bringing them above grade. Um, and by doing so, uh, the, the Comet had surveyed their existing, uh, existing connection line to those transformers and found that the that the line that serviced them currently runs underneath the building and uh, out west and was not in a condition that could could allow for us to reuse that. Uh, so the, the budget has been uh, built around the around providing a new main service feed to those transformers that runs outside of the building down the south to Madison. Okay. Yes, thanks, Mike, for providing some background there. Um, and so, obviously, you know, we, we are in close coordination with them. Um, and uh, uh, and like I said, we've been uh, reaching out to them weekly, and comments have been providing updates, and they respond back to the entire building team as well as uh, uh, the design team as well. So, um, like I said, at this point, uh, uh, we'll just keep uh, everyone informed, and uh, hopefully comment will finish up their design soon. This will uh, you may have you may have said this already. Um, it will bring an additional what amp service to the site. So we are planning uh, as part of the new uh, project 
to be able to accommodate a full campus-wide air conditioning uh, capacity. So that will be a 4,000 amp service um, at a 480 volt uh, transmission voltage, uh, or excuse me, uh, end voltage. Um, and then there will be two additional services uh, that will be at the two, uh, 208 voltage, and they will eat, uh, they will be 2,000 amp, or there is an option to go to 3,000 amp to allow for uh, future expansion. You know, we believe at either 2,000 or 3,000, there will be a, a significant uh, spare capacity for the future, um, and it's uh, uh, really just an dis ongoing discussion between uh, the electrical design team. Uh, the building management team and comment. So, uh, so three electrical services will be the end result so this uh, of is, this project. This is being designed to handle all of the air conditioning that will be put in for the entire building over the life of the, not only this phase, but other phases. Future phases, yeah. Right, yes, we're, we're, we're constructing the infrastructure to accommodate that. And there's what, is it, any of this gonna still be underground? Or did you say it's gonna be, are they gonna bring it out? Pulling it out of the basement, the subterranean. Okay. Yeah, well, where's it being located? Yeah, the, 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 the service to the building will be underground, okay. and it'll run to the Comet transformers, um, which will be near the loading dock of uh, of uh, Building A, and as well as uh, uh, just south of there. But everything will be underground. And that's where they are now, the transformers. So there's, there's a number of different transformers. There's one in the basement uh, of building A, as Michael referred to, in an underground vault. And then there are some additional uh, switch, uh, kind of switch gear and transformers just south of there, um, out of what is currently the, uh, um, I guess it'd be the ROTC storage room of building B. Um, and so we will be consolidating uh, these services uh, to all uh, above ground uh, transformers. As Mike mentioned, uh, and as LT can tell you, uh, uh, the underground vault is prone to significant flooding, and so that will be a major uh, resiliency improvement for the district to no longer have uh, uh, electrical services prone to flooding. Yes, so, Ms. Kelly, um, all of the ComEd infrastructure that's coming in from ComEd will be underground. All of the transformers will be brought above grade because of all the flooding issues we've had in the past at Proviso East. Yeah, because um, I thought they were doing more underground now, ComEd. Yes, so their service will be completely underground. Mm -hmm. um, it, and all the equipment transformers, switch gears, that stuff will be above grade. And, and we're, we're also working on uh, getting comment to uh, pull the uh, overhead lines that are currently in the student parking lot underground as well. So uh, that design is under process also. Uh, we, we, we didn't have the ability to do that under sequence one where we're converting that into an open, open uh, PE field and a walking track. Uh, but we're hoping to get that done here uh, shortly as well. So, so Michael, the district on last Tuesday had a meeting with ComEd, and ComEd uh, provided some information back where they believe the underground service across the street is going to cost anywhere from three hundred fifty to $450,000 additional. So I asked them to provide both above ground and underground just in case if we were way over budget that we still could move forward with the design. And that's, that's an above ground to relocate outside of the middle, the middle of that, uh, that parking area, correct? Yes. What was the first step? Yes, the, the walking track and playing field across First Avenue. Yeah, right now it's above ground. Obviously we would love for it to be underground uh, because the kids could utilize that space and not have to worry about running into poles. So ComEd said that it'd be for 350 to 450 additional. That's their thinking on what it's gonna to take to bring it in. So I asked them to provide an overhead and an underground schematic so that you guys would have a chance to design both of them. And price it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so, oh. If no one has anything else on the ComEd update, uh, so moving on to topic number two. I had one more thing. I want to make sure oh, that sorry. Yep. the delay with ComEd with the COVID related to the schedule. Are we behind? Are we on target? Are we ahead of schedule? So based on feedback from our electrical design team, uh, at this point, uh, if ComEd uh, provides their design uh, in the timeline that uh, they most recently 
uh, provided in the correspondence that we all received, which I believe was we can expect uh, a design in the next few days, um, then they are confident that uh, uh, there will be no issues with the uh, um, uh, early October issue, uh, document issuance. Uh, at this point, because you know, we are kind of at the whims of ComEd's design team, I uh, can't really provide any more you know, uh, information than that. We're, we just kind of have to take the correspondence they give us at face value. So um, right now we're, we're, we're okay, um, but we will obviously keep an open dialogue with uh, the building team if uh, any delays with ComEd would uh, cause a, uh, a delay in our issuance. In the end, you know, there, Joel, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, you know, there is some buffer in the bidding schedule, um, potentially, you know, if, if ComEd does take longer. So um, we don't anticipate any delays uh, on that regard, do we, Joel? No, we should be able, we should be good. I mean, the big push is things that are going to be starting early next year. Uh, but, you know, as long as we keep them on task, I think we should be fine. And, and to comments credit here, um, you know, they've had a lot of things that they that have come into their plate uh, from the, from the, anything from COVID issues to the derecho that came through a few weeks back that, that significantly tasked their engineering staff. And then they had a uh, couple engineers that were called out on military duty. Um, so it, it, it's been, they've been juggling it and, and, and trying to get uh, us the information as quickly as they can. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Yeah, they, they've, they've been forthcoming with information and, and, and been in constant communication uh, with us, so. Okay. Okay, relative to two and three, I just want to keep us moving a bit. Um, I yep. think two and three are items that um, Perkins and Will has um, developed in order to kind of get advance notice of potential change orders to the board. Uh, so the mock-up exercise is one where we'll take a classroom and we'll actually put in a mock-up of it there and see what kind of issues we encounter so that we can start getting a heads up fairly early to the board. And see what our expect or what the result will be. Right. Yeah, and you have something something to look okay, at okay, too. Here's what the example yeah. will be. What type of space we use as, as a mock-up at this point, working on with the, the, the building model. Right, and then the east boiler house concealed basement, a little bit to the south of the boiler house, there was a former structure there and the foundations are still in place. And um, they're just giving us a heads up that now on that, there might be something in the future. Yeah. So, okay, so what's next? So very briefly, remind us all on contingencies, allowances, etc. So uh, the big picture, the overall read here is the total project budget. Within that, you, you break it into two components. You have the indirect costs, which uh, I'll, I'll share in a minute, and you have the direct costs. So those are the two components. The indirect uh, costs, which are oftentimes referred to as soft costs, include everything from fees, construction management services, existing conditions, documentations, soil material testing, permitting, uh, furniture, equipment, systems. So that's part of what you need to do as a part of a project, any, any client, any project. And then on the, the um, direct construction side, the project bid includes escalation. By the time you go up to bid, escalation has already been factored in, it's no longer an estimating exercise. There's also outside of that a construction contingency, as well as within the bid itself, project allowances. And so a key, key part to this that you see is the bid itself includes escalation and it's inclusive of all allowances. So IE is anticipating that things are going to come up. We don't always know where it's going to be at all, as far as our allowances, but they're there and they're built in to the bid itself. So you essentially have three primary compartments that you're working with, if you will. The bid amount, your contingency amount, and the soft costs. Those are three big groupings. 
and that bona fide change orders, if you will, are items that come out of the construction contingency amounts. And, and Joe, if you could just update where we are relative to sequence one in the big picture. I think that's part of Joe's presentation. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Joe? Hey. <laughs> awesome. Paul, are you going to run this for me, or how, how do you want to do this? Uh, I can push this part of that. Yeah, these are your pictures. He's got a, he's got a separate presentation. Get some pictures. All right, I'll get. Joe, you want me to get? Well, this is the kitchen. Maybe we're a little bit redundant, but I know we have to work on time. This is moving along very nicely. Just to give you a little visual, if you haven't been out there recently, and how things are looking. It's a really wonderful project. And then the, uh, the parking lot at East. Gates, and this is the uh, advanced machinery, continues to move along at west, and there's the equipment going in. <laughs> if you have a chance to go and see that equipment, it is absolutely fascinating. And that's just the floor the protection covering you're, you're seeing, it's not fixed floor. I'm sorry, Joe, could you repeat that? He said it was the paper covering on the floor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay, this, I think this is your slide, Joe. Yeah, we talked Did about that damaging the brain before moving stuff in. Uh, Joe, I can move, well, Mark, if you don't mind standing up there and moving along his slides. I'm happy to. <clears throat> Joe, you got slide one up. Can you see it? Uh, yeah, I can see it, yes. Well, Mark, Mark kind of stole my thunder with my pretty pictures, but that's okay. That's what Mark was doing. So, yeah, the, the construction of, of the entire summer 2020 program is, is really in the, the final throws. You can see again, this is the uh, Bible West. Uh, it's nice, nice coloring. Again, you see the floor covering. Play bar, click on, just click through it, please. A lot of these pictures are going to be very much the same uh, that Mark just showed. Again, this is the window walls that are going up. On the west side, we have a little delay in the bottom of the windows that they uh, uh, that need to be taken care of. The boilers are installed, they're in, they're done. If you're into mechanical work, a little different view of the parking lot on uh, at the east, the Wazoo East campus. It turned out very nice. Again, same, pretty much the same photos of the culinary facility. All in all, the real happy spaces, they turned out very nice. We should be doing our startups this week and then get into the training turnover. Okay, stop there. So, Mark was discussing allowances, and, and, and we should just take a little more time to. I, I, don't, I don't want to assume anything. Thank you. So when we, when we bid the trade packages, we tell the contractors on each one of the bid trade packages to include a certain amount of dollars for allowances. And as Mark had indicated, we know that, especially when you're dealing with existing buildings, things are going to come off, they always do. And so we try to allow for them by having a budget in the each of the trade packages that as, as your fiduciary, we manage the work to the, the best that we can, to the cheapest value that we can. And so what we're seeing here are what the allowances were on day one after the bids for, uh, for Prize of East, we had $441,000. We've spent 197, so we still have 240, $3,500 left of those allowances. So we're doing really well at East. West is very similar. We had $429,000. Um, we've used $232,000. And we have $197,000 left. And at PMSA, we had $132,000. We really haven't done much of anything out there. So it's still left. So these are dollars that are embedded 
in the bid packages and are, st are still currently there. Um, and again, they account for the unknowns, the unforeseen. There, you know, anytime, especially in older buildings, when you open a wall, you don't know what you're going to find. So we build this into the program. Actually, when we develop our estimates, it's part of the construction contingency that we, we have on the bottom line always because there's a certain amount of changes and unknowns that are always going to happen. So we try to account for that. Our experience has, has told us roughly it's, it's like a 7% figure. And this, this is how we account for it. So currently, as of right now, we're still holding very strongly on the allowances for the, the three packages. The next slide, Mark. Let me go down. We track changes or change orders differently. Uh, credits to the to the program, um, savings that we find. We we call them change orders. Uh, typically, this money would come out of contingency. I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, out of construction contingency, which is held separately outside of the, the trade documents. Uh, we've done a good job of actually getting enough savings that ultimately we haven't had the right change orders against this, except um, I, I see that I should have updated this for the this being construction on the bottom, there's no value there. That's, that would be the upcharge for the uh, site utilities at PMSA, so I apologize. I'll have to make sure that's updated for the board meeting. So pr prior to that, we were still holding $236,000 of credits back to the district. So we haven't touched any of that contingency money that was in, in place since day one. Now with the Bisping construction contract, uh, roughly five hundred thousand dollars, that will be, you know, that two thirty-six, as well as some of the contingency that was in the contract to begin with. Uh, but we were carrying roughly eight hundred thousand dollars in the contract overall. So our, our contingencies are still very strong as well, associated with the twenty twenty work. And I apologize. I just realized I didn't have that in there. But I will update this for the board meeting so that it properly reflects all the changes to date. Is there any questions about the allowances or change orders that we have currently? So some time ago, um, I think the board's probably seen this for two or three months now, the, both of these schedules. Um, I think uh, probably three or four months ago, I asked um, Gilvane to start presenting this at every board meeting. It has every dollar of, of allowance use. It has every dollar of change order in it. We've only talked about the things over 25000 with the board, but all of the items are on there. So to add to that, Paul, this morning, Perkins and Will in the district had a conversation about change orders. We want to make sure that we provided enough information so that anyone who reviewed it could understand it. So Perkins and Will will be moving forward with change orders by providing a rationale, taking pictures, breaking down the cost. We put those packs together and we get it to the superintendent's office. And we're also going to make a, a distinction between what's in from the allowance money that we anticipated versus a bona fide change order. Because we've already, it's the, the big cost already has allowances built into it. It's, it's anticipating unforeseen conditions, it's anticipating that there's going to be some things that happen. Any other questions? I was going to make a recommendation out here. If we could get that possibly in the way that you guys did the, um, the, the, the in house. Okay. Repairs, you and those updates and those committee. I don't, I don't know if you'd have to do it in a committee report, but in this particular portion, I mean, we can have it that way so that it, it, at each board meeting we can see the pictures and the justification in that way. I think the pictures just, I, I can speak for myself, the pictures help me out a lot. Absolutely. But, and when I can see the pictures and the price accounted to it with an explanation, it just helps me a lot. I don't know what a PCI is. <laughs> I don't know what. I'm just being honest, so it's easier for me. I'm gonna to have to ask afterwards what this stuff means. I understand the numbers, 
I understand some of what this stuff is over here under the contractors, but when we see those pictures, right. for, just for me, I know it helps me a lot. Yep. And if we get, when you guys were doing that with the construction, the month-to-month -month construction inside the buildings and showing us what broke and what you fixed, that would be easier, I think, for us Absolutely. to understand too. Thank you. What is PCI? Testing. Joe. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Joe PCI acronym. Potential change changes. Uh, I forgot what I is. <laughs> okay. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's information. That's yeah. change. Okay. So, when you said that, I'm thinking to myself, what is the I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask. That's the change. Cool. You know these change. Okay, Joe, is that you done? Uh, I think we should go one more slide. There you go. So this is just an update of the allocations. Uh, based on all numbers that we have today, inclusive of the flooring bid last week, as well as utility bid, this just shows a, a quick summation of how the allocation is uh, working between KMSA East and West, uh, West, West, West is cut off there. Uh, total allocations at 57 million 488 is what the current, I mean, absolute current caught off the press estimate for my estimators for the entire program is currently at. Funds committed to date, those are the dollars that we have either written contracts for or we have bids for, i.e. flooring bid and utility work. Um, and just doing straight line math, it just shows your remaining allocations per school based on the 5%, 63%, and 32%. And then just shows the remaining uh, DD estimate. I'm sure I need to change that as well. It should be construction document estimates. Um, those are, again, from my estimator, what the remaining work at East and West are currently valued at. And it just shows a uh, variance up and down. It always will be zero. And just, again, just showing the graphically here so you can see it, how the, the original allocation percentages are currently looking as associated with what the program, remaining program values are. So, with, so Joe, with this being uh, revised bid, PMSA is $178,820 over for this summer's work? Correct. Am I reading over, that right? Over the 5%. Okay. So again, we're just looking at allocations. Mm. Yes, over 5%. But 5% was the allocation for PMSA. Correct. That, that, that only equates to the allocation percentages, is all it equates to. East and West are, are those positive, positive variances or negative? Those are, I don't see it. East is positive and West is negative. West is negative. Mm. Say it louder. Why, was, why isn't that West negative? Again, these are just uh, allocation percentages. If you let's look at West. We're saying West was supposed to get 32% of the total project. So 32% of the 57,500,000 equals 18,400,000. To date, we allocated, spent, contracted $7.5 million, which leaves $10.8 million left in that bucket. The work for, for my estimator that's left to do it, West, is valued at $13 million. So that's where that delta comes. We, we, we're saying to maintain 32%, you only have 10.8. We're saying the work is worth 13.1, therefore the negative variance. Why the increase? The, actually, this, the, it's not an increase. Uh, we've been tracking uh, that variance pretty much from the very early on in the program. Now, we, we've, uh, we've done a lot of modifications to the overall scope to try to get these more in sync with each other uh, very very early on. Once we 
get better price. Uh, once you start estimating next year's work, we'll be able to see more where this work is at. And what, what we're also doing is there's one big program set aside for 2022 at, e I'm sorry, at West, which is the uh, new entrance. What we are currently holding in our pricing is the, uh, the, uh, the entrance that everybody wants to put in. It's a brand new, really nice entrance, but it's got a, a, a price tag to it. We can skinny that up and achieve the same desires at a much less of a cost if after we start bidding things for 2021, we find that this variance is still there and we, we don't want to reallocate, if you will, then um, we can make some changes. Currently, so, cur uh, no, I'm sorry. In addition, if you look at East, with everything that we've got on the boards, we only have $24.8 million of work left. So we have, you can say, the East needs to find $2.4 million more work to do so that the allocation stays the same. Or you can start looking at reallocating and saying, no, East is fine. They've gotten everything they need. It's, it's you know, if you do the needs analysis and say, no, they don't need to put any more in place. We can take those funds, that $2.4 million of the variance for East, and reallocate that between West and PMSA. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not, it, it's not like it's, it's uh, uh, an uh, well, dollars. If, if, if I may, if I may, the, the key, a key part, uh, and I appreciate your, um, uh, just Kelly <laughs> grimacing on that. This amount for Proviso West for that entry was something that is desired but not necessary. It's currently being held in the estimate. So just think of it, right? We have it's a, it's a zero sum game. It's just taking it and reallocating it so that that money would go to East as originally intended and not having as much of uh, money go towards that, that entry at West. Right, so a couple months ago, um, as these projects were getting bid for this year, I told these guys, don't lose sight of those original allocations, because I know how important they are. Don't lose sight of them. So we, we uh, Joe developed this to make sure we're focused on those original allocations, because we know how important those were and what a big part of the community engagement process that was. Yeah, because East West is, they just did a new entrance way over there for everyone to come in. But like you said, it's not needed, it's not necessary. There's different shades of gray, so to speak, how to solve it, period. I'll just leave it at that. We're, we're tracking it, and, and I guess uh, that both uh, Perkins and Will and Gilbane are hopeful that these these numbers will come more back into line as projects yeah. as projects occur. Um, Joe, you done? So we can move. I'm done. Okay. Um, LT admin wise, anything to add to what these guys have said? No. Thank you. You know what? I got a question in reference to the PMSA parking lot. Where are we at? Joe, the progress. Status on PMSA parking? Mm hmm. Ms. Patterson, yeah. Yeah. That's directed to me, correct? Correct. Right. Uh, uh, contractors are remobilizing. Uh, we're just getting the, the resubmittals of some of the information. Construction should start out there, if not this week, next week. So you'll see the actual construction happening uh, real soon. And what's the allowance amount for uh, any unforeseen situation? Joe, so question from Ms. Patterson. Is the allowance amount for unforeseen conditions for PMSA? Is it PMSA? Go, Mark, could you click up two slides? <laughs> Mark, scroll down a little bit. 
This number here, Joe? Yes. <coughs> okay. I think unless there's more questions, I think that's the F and P update. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Okay, um, so financial reports, July 2020, pages 6 through 7, 15 of the packet. We have a bid, we have a rebid in here on the auto shop flooring. Correct. It's, for, it's in for an action item. The estimate says 130, but the lowest bid was, in, am I reading that right, 389? Uh, page 27. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that. Okay, that's coming up. Yep. I didn't know if he had the answer. Um okay. Joe Joe will remain on the okay. on the line for for that. That Joe, that was about the auto shop floor. Correct. And we'll get to that in a minute. Um item agenda item six, financial reports. Uh, pages six through fifteen of the uh, of the package. Page what? Uh, page six through fifteen of the package. Um, you guys have. I'm going to take the opportunity right here. Page seven. Um, we haven't focused a lot of on that, but since I've gotten here, that format of financial reporting. Uh, has been included in the packet. Uh, we haven't focused on it, but I, we're going to start focusing on that particular um, report. It has a lot of the same information as the as the subsequent reports, but it's in a one-page uh, visual. I was talking to Dr. Henderson the other day and uh, told him that I am used to uh, providing quarterly variance reports. Of, of budget to actual and actual of, uh, for the period of this year compared to actual for the same period last year. And he has indicated to me that he would very much like to see that happen uh, for, the, for the board to have those reports and those narratives. What happens is I take this form and I overlay it one over the other and I get the differences. And then I know where to look for the differences. And um, it allows us to uh, not explain all the differences, because we don't want to get into all of them, but maybe with eight or 10 items, we're explaining 90% of the differences. And that leaves the board with an understanding of those eight or nine items that are accounting for 90% of the differences and makes for a pretty efficient discussion. And he's, um, he's uh, charged me with getting that going, and um, um, I'm happy to do it. Um, it's uh, it's easier for me to do now because I own last year's data too. Uh, so year over year we're in the same accounting system and should be able to provide that. So start in um, October, it'd probably be, uh, we present September in November, so it'll probably, when those quarters are hitting, September, December, March, and June, it'll be the months that we present those financials. What's the difference in this? and the revenue year-to-date comparisons? Uh, well, the revenue numbers should agree. Um, if you look at the next page, the second column of numbers, mm -hmm. 10608535, mm -hmm. uh, you've got 10608537, there's a rounding difference there. Okay. Uh, but it's, uh, this has the funds down the side, right. the, the, the one pager has them across the top, but then also provides um, sources from local money, federal money, state money, you see? Right. And, um, and then the same thing on expenditures, the funds are across the top, and the type of expenditure, salary, benefits, et cetera, is down the side. Um, 
So it is it is probably 95% of the same information, but it's in one page. Gotcha. Uh, the grant report is something new, but um, there isn't a lot to discuss relative to July, because it's one month worth of data, but I, I took the time there to explain to you what's coming. Uh, any questions on the treasurer's and grant reports? Or the bill list? Uh, we we only had a few copies of the bill list. Uh, we are what page is the grant report? Oh, I was on page, sorry to say, page seven. Page seven, the one pager? That's the grant report? Yeah. Miss hmm. Kelly, it looks like this. Okay, so you did the grant report used to list all of the grants. Yeah, the grant report is additional, and we won't drop the grant report. We won't. Oh, okay. okay. Not, um, I won't drop the old report either until the board's totally comfortable with the one picture. Um, yeah, so the grant report has one month's worth of summer activity for the grants on it. The grant report starts at page 14. I'm not hearing any questions. Are we ready to move on? Okay. Uh, PMSA Curie Licensing Agreement. Um, this is, as we know, in finance and facilities, we often talk about ideas and concepts um, and before they get to the board for uh, consideration, before there's a recommendation made out of this committee to the board. So PMSA Curry um, licensing agreement, um, when, we, uh, when we designed, when the project got designed, um, there was a saw cut um, along six inches of inside our east lot line between us and Curry. Uh, the issue uh, became apparent to Curry and they attended our Village of Forest Park meeting and said, hey, the fence here is going to create a problem with us. I don't know that they realized at the time that they, their dry aisle actually is some of our property. Um, and so when we get our MWRD approved design in, uh, we're going to saw cut six inches from the property line, which is going to take about 12 inches of their drive aisle and the curb. They thought they owned the property all the way over the curb. There's no boundary dispute. They know that they don't now. Uh, that's been made clear to them. <laughs> um, but that's the impervious surface that is needed for the MWRD approval to become permeable, which is what grass is. So um, they, they, uh, they've been told, you know, this has to become grass. And they said, okay, but we need to have uh, the ability to park cars along there and open doors. So they've asked us to move the fence in, into our property. Uh, folks uh, here do not feel like that will really impact our physical education uh, program or use of that uh, that space, and it won't impact the water reclamation design. Okay, uh, so one of the things that the board is going to be asked to consider is um, potentially do we give them a licensing agreement to use that property? Uh, Forest Park would like to see us do that. Uh, Curry is a large taxpayer. Uh, they'd like the neighbors to play well together. And um, uh, Mr. Gleason thinks we can do it in a way that um, uh, won't cause that property to become tax ex uh, taxable. If it does, Curry will pay their taxes. And we're looking at a 10-year agreement so that it can be revisited um, in 10 years. So we're kind of negotiating over the position of the fence. It's just three feet west? Yeah. They have said that would be helpful to them. I don't think we can give it the entire length because it starts impacting the way um, 
the way our auxiliary parking lot knows the cars that nose in there. We don't want to be hitting the fence uh, with the nose of our cars because we move the fence for to help them out. But along the play field, it can be moved uh, and then moved back to the lot line um, further north where we've got storage and we have more use for the, the, the space to park um, equipment and, and store salt and things. So. And, and you said that Forest Park wants us to get a license for them? No, Forest Park would like us to see if we can accommodate Curry's request. Okay, they got Forest Park there so oh, all booked up, right? Yeah, it, the, yeah. The, the, the permit has been issued with the fence as originally designed. They think Forest Park can, uh, Forest Park thinks it'll be within their authority of their administration to move that fence and approve it without having to go through the re-permitting and re-engineering and any of that. Well, did, did LT, didn't Curry, some years ago, we had issues with the parking lot, and, and Curry was trying to um, get a little bit of it. And, you know, of course, it was voted down. They wanted a little bit of it without paying any money. Do you recall them when it's going? Yeah, they wanted to, they wanted to use, they wanted to park, park on it. On it. Yeah. They wanted to park on it. If I recall correctly, um, I think that they wanted to um, provide the district with driver's education vehicles at that time as a swap yeah, I remember off. They wanted about that also. Yeah. Yeah. But we didn't, but like we didn't get that. Miss mm -hmm. um, Grant? Yes. I had a meeting with Curry uh, when I was principal of PMSA downstairs. And what they were trying to do was use that part, park their cars, if they would give us used cars for our driver's ed and we can partner that way. And did that happen? No, because we didn't give them that piece of property. Right. And they got angry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah that was so we're back actually for the same little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they offered to swap used cars for use of the property right. or the property itself? Right, to use just to use it to park the car. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So so this is not a final, uh, this is the purpose of bringing this here is for discussion. Um, and and the, the recommendation will be pivoted one way or the other depending on the discussion that's occurring here for being time for the board meeting action. Um, it can be done, whether we want to or not is kind of the question. There's no cost involved in it for us. So we're just talking about a basic agreement, right? Yep, a basic li license agreement. We're looking to have them incur some of the cost of the fence for the next ten years. For the next ten years. Great. And what's the cost of the fence, and what amount would they? Uh, Joe, are you still there? Joe is working up some estimates for us for the, for the cost. For long time. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. I didn't hear the question. The question was the cost of the fence. I've, I know I had you guys working up some various scenarios. Right, and uh, I don't have that at my fingertips. Sorry. Okay, so we'll get that for you um, by Tuesday's meeting. So is there a... I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. I don't think it's going to impact um, anything we're doing in our set of events. So, Dr. Henderson, I think I'm hearing to bring it forward this way for approval of the license agreement and let the board, the whole board, hear it. We've got, it sounds like a couple that are sort of inclined and a couple that aren't, but then the whole board would consider it can either thumbs it up or down. So they're just going to take the fence down. They're not going to take any of our property. Mm -hmm. It's just—is that what you're saying? No, they will. Everything east of the fence, which is on their side of the fence that's moved three, 
three to four feet off of the property line, they would maintain it. Uh, they would be able to parallel park along the uh, pavement and then open doors without hitting the fence, damaging their vehicle or damaging the fence. So um, they're talking about three to four feet mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of our For sections property. Of, that's correct. And then they would contribute. How uh, many sections of, you know, how, how long? Uh, there is a, there is a, um, there's their, the thin area of the drive. The, the, the maps didn't copy very well. The thin area of the drive would be where um, uh, about 18 inches off the property line, mm -hmm. but then by the service area, which is further up, and the and the building moves east, it's wider. They they back cars into that, and uh, that's where their service pickup is for for people that are picking up service cars. They go out there and drive away. Uh, that's where they need it to be a little bit wider. And then further north, where our storage area is, it'll go all the way to the lot line like it was originally designed. And for that, they're, they're talking about uh, potentially sharing some of the cost of the, of the fence. That, that's what's kind of on the table. So I, I asked Dr. Henderson a question. Does that make sense to move forward in that way? Yes, but I would like for you to share everything, including the additional 18 inches that they are requesting. Mm -hmm. Right. Share that. Okay. Um, the action item. I think that's in the action item. It says 36 inches. It's, it, it, yeah, it was originally designed for 18, and they've asked for an additional for 36. Right, it says 36 in the, in the yeah. action item. Yeah. yeah, it's in there. Okay. Okay, the next item is um, the auto shop flooring recommendation that um, Mr. Alexander brought up earlier. It's on page 27 to 31. Uh, Joe, are you there? I am here. Could you touch this? I guess that was my cue to talk. I think it should be. There we go. Okay, in this item, um, we we rebid the, the flooring because we had no bidders on the original uh, bid package that went out. Uh, Gilbane's estimate uh, for the cost of this was $130,000. Um, 389 is the low bidder. Um, Gilbane has gone back and looked at this and believes that the, the low bid is the proper value and that their estimate was wrong. Again? <laughs> They have a 3% of the right? Joe, do you want to go through um, the differences sure. between the bit, what was included in the, the estimate and uh, what the low bid was and the, the, you know, the various parsing of that? Uh, I can do that. Do you want me to share a screen, or there's actually in the back end of my presentation? I think it's currently up on the board. There's a synopsis as well. Or we'll just talk about it. There's another slide. There are a couple more slides back there. Just um, if you want to advance that, or I can share my screen here. I have it up on my screen. I'll move the I'll move the screen. Thank you. 
going, keep going, keep going. There you go. Back there? Yes, sir. So, obviously, we were, uh, one, I, I apologize for having to even explain this to everybody, but, uh, you know, when we had an estimate of $130,000 and the bids come in, so if we just higher, we, had, we need to understand what was going on, what happened. Um, again, our original foreign estimate was $130,000. That was based on the, uh, the, the CD drawings just before the issuance of the bid. Um, and once we, the issue for bid documents, there were some changes that my estimator did, did recognize that didn't get carried forward from me, from him to me to you. I should have had that information to the, to everybody so that we could have updated our numbers. That's on me. But the bottom line, the changes were the there was an additional 1,254 square feet of uh, tile that was installed, and as well as there's an underlayment. Um, this is. Unfortunately, my estimator assumed a gypsum underlayment, which was used at culinary and advanced manufacturing, was the type of underlayment to use. Okay. Uh, being an auto shop, the underlayment was actually a concrete type product, which is much more expensive. You can see the delta there, it added $98,000 to the estimate. And that this is, I had him go back and just re estimate to see. What he can come up with. Uh, in addition, there's some waterproofing built into the program of $17,000 that he did not have. I can say this: it might be a savings to back to the district if we do the moisture testing, which is lying underneath it. If it shows that the moisture values of the concrete are within the requirements for this type of material, we don't have to do. Um, moisture mitigation. Uh, moisture mitigation concrete retains moisture to a certain level depending on its environment and the coatings that you put on top of concrete with high moisture it, it doesn't adhere and they, you end up getting separation so it's a, something that needs to be looked at all the time. The $17,000 he was not carrying, he wasn't carrying moisture testing, uh, he didn't realize that we had uh, made a more aggressive schedule, so we, within the bid on something like this, we have the contractors assume that they're going to be working overtime. It's the only way to make the schedule. So there's another seventeen, almost eighteen thousand dollars in it. On top of that is the allowance that we talked about earlier. So that's the allowance dollars that we add to each one of the bids. Again, these are items that were not recognized by my estimator when we put the numbers out there, which means that with the one thirty or one thirty one thousand dollar original estimate was woefully long. If you take the one thirty and add those deltas, you scroll down you see that his estimate would be more than three hundred and fifty two thousand dollar range. Um, the actual low bid was three eighty nine. Um, again that type of spread wouldn't concern me. Obviously, a spread of 130 to 389 is enormous. Um, uh, we've sat down with my estimators and the head of the estimating department to make sure that we put a little more checks and balances in place so this doesn't happen. Uh, you know, we, we bid roughly $20 million worth of work to date for proviso, and our bids have been coming in very favorably, very good, and very strong. This is uh, hopefully just an anomaly that. Uh, we will do everything in our power to make sure it doesn't occur again. That explains the dollar value differential, but so now the question comes is there's two possible scenarios that the board can take. One is obviously, you know, we bid this work out, we know that the $389,000 is a, a fair price for that type of work and that type of flooring. It's not necessarily what we were looking for, but with the allowances that we saw previously and, and the, uh, that are still within the program, overall, the, the, the value of the construction program is doing very well on budgets. 
Um, so it comes down to whether or not this is the flooring that everybody really wants. If they want something that's down and dirty and you know polished concrete, we can look at that, but that would mean rejecting this bid. Um, so you know, for me as your construction manager, the three nine three hundred eighty nine thousand dollars is a fair and equitable price for that work. <coughs> Uh, but it just depends whether that's what the flowing that ultimately the end users are looking for and want to be put in there. We can do it, again, much more cost effectively by going with a different system, more of a polished or sealed concrete. There are some values that we will still have to add to it. Um, right now, currently in those spaces, the existing gym floor is being demolished. Uh, it's under <coughs> Uh, asbestos containing material so I can't get in there. They should be done this Wednesday. At that time I can look at the flooring. If we wanted to go to a plan B and come up with, uh, between myself and design partners, we can come up with a plan B that's going to be more cost effective and do that. So it really comes down to preference of what the, the school and the end users are looking for for the, that flooring surface. If they're looking for a flooring surface that's more in line with what we did culinary and advanced manufacturing, it's 389. If you're looking to go something more industrial, like you would see in a garage or in any automotive garage, really, I don't have the numbers, but it'll definitely be less than that. Uh, it just will have a, a completely different look to it. I can only apologize for the uh, the estimate being so far off, again, we, we put some checks and balances in place so we don't have the situation. We're very proud of our estimators and our ability to accurately estimate work that we have for the 20 million we've done so far. And that's the, that's where we're at, that's how we got here, and I'll entertain any questions. So Joe, for my, um, my summarization, my understanding is the 73,268 was actually a scope change. We put this floor in more area, the classrooms and the storage than we anticipated. Part of that is all, it's, uh, it's 1,254 additional square feet, but it's also the, the underlayment associated with that type of work. Most of it's the underlayment cost. Um, that, that was $5 a square foot for the underlayment. Um, so right. we so, can reduce that and the underlayment and, and, and you know get those two additional rooms back down to a different type of flooring system that's more economical. Right. So so though generally the statement that, that the scope change is, is correct, the ninety eight thousand is the actual um, oversight of the of the estimator, the Gilbane estimator of going concrete versus gypsum and then the weather uh, waterproofing membrane the moisture testing etc sort of related to that that is correct thank you so we put the um the agenda item again for per discussion purposes here with the finance and facilities committee to go ahead and move forward with the bid. Uh, if we reject it, we'll come back with a different design. And that would be what would be discussed on Tuesday. If you want us to bring it forward in that way. Well, what are you basically bringing this to us upon? What's the, what's the rationale for going ahead with this bid? The, the reason is, uh, the rationale is that this was the, the system that was originally discussed. Um, and uh, the pricing was obvious, the estimate was obviously wrong, but that was the, what was originally discussed. We wanted to give the board the opportunity to get what was originally discussed as long as it represented fair value. And they're saying 350, 389 is within the fair value scope of things. So it's fair value and it was what was originally discussed. We're not necessarily saying that that's what should be done, it's just, we wanted the opportunity given to the board to do that if that's what the board wanted. Okay, so notwithstanding the the, the 
the misbid or the misestimate. This is the recommendation. Is this within the budget of what we, what was planned and designed for the auto shop? Is this still within the budget or is this taking us over? It's still within the overall budget. It's, I'm sorry? It is still within the overall budget. That, that, would, that would help to know. The overall budget or, but I think Rodney's question, I just want to be sure we're all talking about the same thing. Rodney's question was, is this in the budget of the auto shop? Not the overall budget, yes. Not, not, the, yeah, not, the, not the big scope, but is this within the scope of what we had estimated for the, the totality of the auto shop? Mm -hmm. Are we, is this going to take us into any type of, with that variance, the up and down east and west thing? Not the overall big picture, but the individual the allocations for each school. So we've allocated so much for east. Was this included? Or is this going to take us outside of that allocation? Is my question, I guess. This this has been included in the allocation for okay. East, for the auto shop. Okay. But does this Those take people? us over the budget for the auto shop? Just the auto shop. Correct. Uh, we, we are still within just the auto shop budget. For that one component, though, Joe, the original estimate was one hundred thirty thousand. So, in fairness, it would be about two hundred fifty two hundred fifty nine thousand dollars over the original estimate. I think that's the question. Mm -hmm. It is over the yes. Okay, I guess what happens, but it is over the estimate. Uh, obviously, we were, we were holding one thirty, and now we're three eighty nine. But with the contingencies and, uh, that we have and the allowances that we have built into the program. I'm saying that I, I believe our budgets are still very strong and we're fine. I, I, we're doing well with cash flow. We're doing well with the overall budgets. We keep actually saving money um, and because we're not using a lot of the allowances that are coming back into the program. So I feel confident that this will not impact any of our budgets. Okay, so uh, being a little less general and more specific and, and uh, being completely transparent, even with the 389, you believe that you are within the auto shop but overall budget? The overall budget for, for East, yes. Oh, I thought, you, I thought you, no, I thought I heard you say the auto shop. Oh, you listen. Yeah, he's very specific now. Yeah, just based on Give me one second. I'm pretty sure we are. I want to check one number real fast. Because we have all the other bids. Right. Give me so, one second, please. Yeah. I just don't know how how spending three times the amount on something doesn't take us out of the original estimate for the auto shop cost. And I also am concerned later on down the line, we're going to have to make difficult choices about what goes in that auto shop because we've spent 260000 more than we thought we were going to spend. Mm -hmm. I don't want to mm -hmm. minimize any of the equipment. I know we talked about having the, um, the paint part thing, the I, I, one paint, paint boot, thank you. <laughs> the thing with the car and the paint, you go in it. I don't want to cut down on any of the materials that uh, we want the students to have access to. I mean, these are really career building tools um, and giving them the chance to work on these things in high school it will really give them a boost when they are out of high school. Um, so my question really, I mean, does this take us over the amount budgeted for the auto shop project? This was the last item to be bid, correct, Joe? Yes, it so is. So we have we have actual bids on all of it now, and can compare it to the original estimate, and we should be able right. to tell whether we're over or under. That's what I'm looking at right now. So, so I have a question <clears throat> for the uh, culinary arts and the. Uh, Advanced manufacturing. So, were those floors, for, was the flooring for those two places underbidded also? No, I think those were correct because those had the gypsum underlay, he said.
for those two shops, but for an auto shop, you need something different. You can't so, use the same so materials. The for the culinary arts and the advanced manufacturing was not underbid? I think those came within a reasonable uh, range of the estimate. They did come within a reasonable. All right. Uh, so the tally is, and I misspoke, I apologize. Just the auto shop. I plug that in there. I think my spreadsheet makes sure that the, I want to check one more time before I speak, but I'm pretty sure I have it. If we accept that flooring bid, it puts the overall program over the estimate by $80,651. Say that again, please. Hey, Joe, can you repeat that, please? Certainly. Using the 389000 plug that into all the other estimates, the auto shop budget, the, the total of that increases the overall budget by 80651 So $80,651 more than our original estimate. I think that answers the question and is uh, at the level of precision in our language that we're looking for. Uh, 80, 80 plus thousand would be over budget for the auto shop program only if we accept the 380, if you accept the 380. And if I can add one other little tidbit. In We, we have a total, and this is all included, included in it, but we have a total of $158,000 in allowance across all of the trades. So we have $158,000 in a perfect world, of course, you know or don't live in there. If, if we didn't use any allowance, $158,000 would come back into the program offsetting that 80,651 or if you know if we can save some of it we can potentially get at the end of the day everything within budget <coughs> it's it's a little bit of a uh, the hope but we just want to let you know that we have 158 thousand dollars embedded in allowances Okay, so um, FNF committee uh, board members, uh, we're looking to um, know, I guess, on next Tuesday whether we're going to bring forward a recommendation to approve this bid or bring forward a recommendation to reject the bids. If we could get some sort of idea around that, would you, is that a fair statement, Dr. Henderson? Hey, Joe, question related to schedule. Uh, just hypothetically, if the board voted this down next week, how does that impact the schedule? We, uh, we'll, have, we'll have time, though, it'll be a quick bidding to come to do something else because this work wouldn't take place until uh, late November. It's the last thing that happens in the auto shop. So it could be getting tight with that. Mm -hmm. it's is this a possibility? Can we, can you guys redo your estimate and we go out to bid again? Is it possible that some companies may not have bid on this because they looked at it and said, this is all wrong, we're not going to get, we don't want to bother? I don't think the bid documents were incorrect. Is that right, Joe? No, correct. The bid documents were, to answer your question, that really wouldn't work. Uh, the other two bidders were significantly higher than 389. Um, the chances are that it could actually go up higher. Rebidding the same package, same scope, I don't, I wouldn't recommend doing it. We're going to do something, we need to redesign and rebid, not for the same package. Does this bid consider, I mean, so what we're saying is if we go, if we rebid this, you all's professional opinion is we're going with a lower standard floor. So the only place to go from this to possibly recoup or save of this bid would be to lower 
the quality of the materials we're putting in the auto shop. If that's what I heard you say, we can do something less than what these materials or what this bid is requiring. That would be the option of rebidding at this point or redesigning at this point to lessen the quality from where we are right now. That would be correct. Okay. So I would say my recommendation is bring the bid to the board and let us vote it. And if the, if the board votes it down, then of course we'll rebid. But I would say bring it as an action item and let's re-vote it. Or let's vote it. I, I don't think anybody is going to, I'm not going to go out and say that I put less of a quality floor in the auto shop to save any money. The apology noted the 150000 but if we're going to talk about now that's done, the only decision is what quality we're going to put in there as it relates to the bid. The 130000 versus the three eighty nine. that's a done deal. So now the question is quality okay. as far as the rebid. I don't know if it's a done deal. <clears throat> what are you going to do? Just you accept the bid or you don't? Exactly. That's why I say bring it. All right, we will do. Um, Mr. King, I would like for you to um, clear that up around the end. Yes. Uh, so um, if we were done with discussing the auto shop floor, um, one of the things that I think was um, accurately stated in the, in the memo, but perhaps not um, completely understood or clear, I can clarify the memo. Uh, the original fence line for the Curry Motors fence was 18 inches from the lot line. Curry Motors is asking for, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dan and Dr. Henderson, Curry Motors is asking for an additional 36 inches from that 18 inch fence line or a total of 36 plus 18 from the lot line. Four six inches? Yep. So a total of 54 inches, which would be about uh, four and a half feet. Yep. Is that what's written? Is that, is that That's not correct? It just has three feet okay, then I'll, I'll, I will clarify the memo then for yes. Tuesday. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate that. All right, disposal of district property. Do okay. we have anything else for Joe or can we let him go? I think Joe can go. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. So, disposal of district property. Uh, we had an information item at the last board meeting, I believe, uh, that the library tables at Proviso Peace uh, would be put on the public auction site um, at $100. Uh, the bases of them are very nice. The tops are just laminate tops. Um, and um, we hope to get some bidders on that. So we're looking uh, at Tuesday's meeting for authorization to um, put those on the public auction site, dispose of them. Building updates, LT? Anything? No, the building updates are pretty much straightforward. Um, the IB rooms at both East and West, they're complete and they're ready. Um, we're steadily doing uh, improvements to the buildings, um, infrastructure like blower motors, uh, changing out filters to, uh, to make sure that we filter in the proper amount of uh, particles out of the air. Um, any questions on page 36, 37 about the building updates? And 38, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, PACE budget. Thank you, LT. PACE budget um, is a recommendation uh, of the SPED department to, and a requirement under the joint agreement with PACE that the uh, board of the, of the member, the PACE member, um, so the D209 board approve, review and approve the PACE budget. This is an annual item. 
we will be paying Pace, um, hold me to round numbers, not specific numbers, about $7.7 .7 million um, in, for, for instruction, uh, roughly, well, I probably should be more careful in what I'm saying. $7.7 mm -hmm. .7 million on the instruction, then we also have some money we owe, we pay them for operations and maintenance and some money we pay them for transportation. So our Ed Fund, our Transportation Fund, and our O&M Fund will pay some money to, uh, to PACE. Uh, do you know how many, <clears throat> I see they're saying that the increase is because of social work services that provides of East and West. Do you know <clears throat> how many social workers they're sending to provide of East and provides of West? I will get the answer for you before Tuesday. Uh, Vanessa Schmidt would know that answer off the top of her head, but uh, yeah, because I don't think it's that many. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. How, we, how many students do we actually have? Uh, I don't know. Do we have a? Do we understand? What are they doing remote? Are they doing remote also? I believe they're starting mm -hmm. remote. Mm -hmm. But that's okay, so, we'll so make sure Vanessa has too. transportation, and we're not. In the classroom, they're going to have to. We've got a week, but this is. Why are we paying a transportation increase and kids are not going to the building? What are they transport? There are no field trips with remote learning. I'm getting kind of <laughs> upset with face, and then well, maybe you can help us out. They don't tell us what they're doing, but then they come and ask us for money like they're not. In, we don't transporting any students right now. Are they transporting students to the point of a 10.9% increase in transportation charge to us? Are our students still going into the building at pace or are they still on remote services? Which would to me seem like there's a decrease in costs. But they're saying there's an increase and in your transportation? If the increase is, over the, is what the rate would be if we were under normal operations, perhaps. That's the thing I think Paul needs to check on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the other piece is whether or not under the agreement they have with the vendor, which is first student, mm -hmm. if they are paying anything right now, <coughs> even though they're not transporting. I think mean, right now we're in a situation with them where we're not transporting based on the terms of our agreement, we're currently not paying for those services. Right. But every School district has a different kind of agreement for a student. So. so we may be paying for students to not get on buses. I, I don't know how they're characterizing it or, yeah. or what their agreement mm -hmm. says, but that's mm -hmm. definitely worth looking into. We're we'll doing we'll 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 get back with you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Doc. I, I, you know, I don't, I, you know, I understand PACE provides a very much needed service. I just really wish that they would present to us, since we are their biggest providers of services in the district that they would present to us in such a way that we would have a better understanding of the monies that we're allocating and what they're being used especially around this remote learning period and and all of that implies that that implies i don't see the trend but maybe they have a contract that would be nice to know if in fact that's the case i mean honestly though with the transportation i'm worried that it's a similar situation to the roof I mean, you know. that would be nice to, I'm just saying, even if that's the case, no, it would be nice to know. I want to know that we have no choice. We are stuck by contract that this is what it is, other than the, just giving us this with no explanation and expecting us to vote on it not knowing. You know, I, I don't know. It, it doesn't make any sense to me that I don't even know if they're... I want to say our, our contract renewal with first student, I thought costs only went up 3%, or am I confusing it with... Uh, no, you're 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 right on that. Um, the the I, I believe that first student is operating under a series of one year contracts with first student, so it may have been a one year increase. I know Vanessa Schmidt has um, invited um, uh, Mary Beth Bow and um, Dr. James to be here on Tuesday. I don't know if uh, if um, we're doing that or not, but I know she's made that invitation so that some people will be here to answer questions around it. Yeah, I think it would be, for their sake, it would be good if we had that information before they arrived. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we'll we'll get answers to those questions. I mean, they've got down here shuttles and various field trips. Yeah, there's no field trips. Well, they, they're doing that right now. Now, they would still develop an annual budget. Right. I understand, but just like us, we modify that based upon our operations. We're not just paying bills. But we have a budget, and because of COVID, we modified it with what you guys laid out, the hybrid model versus the remote. There's a change in prices for operations, not on teachers and stuff, but when you start saying to me other transportation expenses, including shuttles and various field trips. There's what we there's what you budget and there's what you end up paying. Right. right. So we still have transportation in our budget. Right. right. Right, but we're not paying it. But why should we be paying I mean when we say okay we have transportation in our budget, but we're not using transportation <coughs> so that money stays with us. Right. Mm -hmm. The difference with pays is they have it in their budget and, and then our money leaves. Yeah, our that money right. from us goes out the door whether they yeah. use it or not. Do we get a refund if they don't use it? Board members. Uh, give me the opportunity to work directly with them. We will get back with you. But you understand our concern. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Ned, because Ned's on the, and Ned's on the uh, board. Right. That's right. We 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 talked about. Okay. We, we Thank you. Thanks, guys. What's next? FY 21 budget recommendation uh, that'll be coming to the board on Tuesday. It is still a work in progress. Um, we're getting we're getting very close to. Um, to final, uh, I had a, a few technical issues over the weekend, and uh, so we had to back up a, an estimate. Um, I've got something a little better that I'll be able to bring shortly. Uh, but for now, it's just letting you know that it's progressing and that it's coming Tuesday, uh, and it'll be a public hearing and then um, adoption during the regular meeting. This is their budget. Their budget. Thank you. This no, this is our budget. Oh, this is ours? Yeah, we went We're from number Pace 12. budget mm -hmm. to our budget on uh, number 12. Oh, wow. Pages 119 to 154 is our budget. We have $50 million worth of construction in there, which is uh, the lion's share of the deficit. Um, we have the four and a half million dollar transfers from Ed Fund and O and into the Capital Projects Fund. So this, what you're looking at, will not be the final proposed for Tuesday, but it's it's um, it's getting there. I don't think we're no. we're looking at anything. We're not. We don't have oh, it. We don't have it. We don't have it. I'm looking at faces, but yeah, no, we don't have ours. Okay, I will get that to you. Um, was. One nineteen to one fifty four. Electronic means it. Oh, it's on the electronic, but it's not in the printed paper. Right. Okay. Um, contract approvals, addendum to the Xerox lease agreement, and AT and T. We don't have those items either. And so for what they, they are not in the printed packet, they are in the electronic packet. Mm So when we get their pace budget, do we get our, are we getting their overall budget or are we getting the budget as it relates to us? What We get both. We get both. We get their overall budget and then they break down the budget into tuition payments gotcha. that uh, D209 will pay. Okay. And that's what I drop into the budget as paid to pace or gotcha. budgeted for pace. Okay. Yeah. 
<coughs> the addendum to Xerox lease agreement was to provide four additional copiers for the IV rooms. Okay. <laughs> so, we don't have that for it. Right. It's on the electronic. Okay. Um, and and LC's on the electronic. Okay, great. And then AT&T is just a renewal of our AT&T um, contract for our phone service. Great. Um, the first time you did it, and you would <laughs> All right, is it? Can we go ahead and adjourn because we can get those um, items via email? They're not, the two contracts to me are not um, huge deals. We need some new copiers. And we're continuing with the AT and T contract that we've had. All right. Let's go with me. We can adjourn. You guys cool with adjourn? Yeah. Because I mean, we'll just get them. They'll be in the packet Friday for the board meeting anyway. Cool. All right. All right. Our next meeting for the finance and facilities uh, committee is going to be Monday, October fifth. Um, this meeting's adjourned. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mayor. I mean, I was saying, ma'am, I didn't say children were looking your way. Stop messing with me. I said, ma'am.